We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer not to be recorded, please go to the LinkedIn Live video feed, the link to which I have just placed in the chat room. This show thrives on participant contributions and all participants are encouraged to actively participate by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please write in the chat room or turn on your microphone to say hi. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Tonight, our featured guest is Nasir Gami, MD, MPH, Professor of Psychiatry at Tufts University School of Medicine, lecture, lecturer on psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and founder of the Psychiatry Letter, a community of clinicians who want to improve psych psychiatric practice by practicing a more scientific and humanistic way, focusing on research data, not the conventional wisdom. Professor Gami, welcome. Hi, Simeon. Thanks for having me. Professor Gami, so tell us a little bit about where you come from, how you became interested in uh, in psychiatry, and why you've dedicated your your life to improving people's mental health. Well, thanks. Um, I'm a professor at Tufts and Harvard um, in the Boston area, and uh, have been here around 30 years. I came up here for my training in psychiatry after medical school, and um, have focused on mood illnesses, depression, and bipolar illness um, over the last 30 years in my in my research and practice. Um, and the social media and depression issues have really arisen in the last decade or so. Um, and why did I get de de dedicate to this kind of work? Um, well, um, I suppose part it was partly in the, one, the, the, the larger question was becoming a doctor and wanting to try to help people with illnesses. Uh, and then among the illnesses that seem to need a lot of help is mental illnesses. And I felt like that was a place where there was less known and where there was more of a way to make a contribution. Um, so I hope that I, I could make a bigger impact there. That's a, a part of the reason why I got into it. Okay. Let's take a look now. Let's get to know what digital depression is by watching this video. We have a major problem, which we could call digital depression. In the last six or seven years, the depression rates have increased by about 30 to 40 percent in teenagers. Suicide rates have gone up 30 percent among boys, and they've literally doubled 100 percent increase in teenage girls. There's no biological explanation for this massive increase in depression, anxiety, and suicidality. The suggestion I'm making is that there's a cultural explanation, which is the rise of social media. The average teenager spends about seven hours a day on their smartphone. In general, social media is not passive anymore. It's very interactive. So, you know, you're texting with friends and you're sending pictures. You know, so there is someone else on the other end. That can be good and that can be bad. You know, if it's a positive relationship, you might feel better. If it's a negative relationship, though, it could make you feel a lot worse. So, for instance, the people talk about the fear of missing out experience, especially with Snapchat, Instagram, where people are in real time talking about where they are. And so with teenagers, young adults, the low self-esteem arises from not being invited to a party or not being invited to a certain group to go out. Once or twice or three times, that probably wouldn't make anyone feel bad, but when it's happening every day, dozens of times, and in a month, hundreds of times, it's very easy for that to add up to reduce that person's self-esteem. As a culture, we have to realize we have a problem and we have to figure out how to fix it. We basically need to get children to wait, just like they've waited to drive, they wait to drink, they need to wait to responsibly use social media. I would recommend not giving smartphones to children at all, not giving it to uh, children until they get into the adolescent years, maybe age 13, 14. And then if teenagers have anxiety and depression, I think we should take away their social media, just like you would stop it if they had an alcohol problem or a drug problem. It's really changed childhood and adolescence, and personal experiences for the next generation. Okay, so uh, I'm now I'm going to share another another screen 
with an article uh, that um, is about this. So I'm going to share that screen. So, uh, Professor, tell us um, tell us a little bit about this depression. Uh, quote, rates of anxiety and depression among college age students began to rise around 2011. This coincides with the first wave of iGen, or kids who grew up with the internet in their pocket after the advent of the iPhone. So uh, people of, of my generation, I think all the generation, uh, most of the generation of our participants, we we saw social media as something that was kind of fun that, oh, wow, that's neat. You know, I don't have to wait for the phone line to get free to call somebody, you know, or, or I can communicate in all these different ways with these people around the world. That's then act, actually didn't turn out to be the same experience for younger people. Tell us a little bit about digital depression and what that means. Well, I mean, it, it really is about um, the correlation between the rise of smartphones, the use of social media on phones in particular, and um, increasing depression rates in general uh, in the whole population, but um, markedly so in, in teenagers. Um, and we're seeing, you know, the, 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 the day that uh, Steve Jobs went and held up the iPhone for the first time to applause was late 2007, I believe. Um, and I think Facebook was invented 2004, 2005. And then right after he held up the phone, within the next three to four years, you had LinkedIn and and um, YouTube was, had just come up. Uh, but then you had Snapchat and uh, Instagram um, and then WhatsApp within a year or two after that. So it's only been 10, 15 years. This is a very short amount of time that all these things that we now take for granted have come into existence. And so we are literally experimenting with the whole world's population with what this does. I don't think anyone had an inkling, really, I doubt it, that they could be so harmful. Um, as, as we were talking earlier, and then the Facebook kind of, when, and when uh, Mark Zuckerberg came to Harvard to give a commencement uh, keynote address five, six years ago, it was all about how we were connecting people. That was like the ethos behind it. But um, we're connecting people in harmful ways as opposed to beneficial ways. And that's not something they really ever, I don't know if they expected it, but they certainly didn't take it into account. And I think it wasn't probably so societally until 2016 to 2018 that we got the first inklings that this was harming teenagers. This is about five, six years into it. And maybe more broadly, it became more evidenced when other harms came into a uh, discussion, which I hadn't discussed before. But in 2016, the effects in the presidential election uh, with Facebook in particular raised the question that this is not just about it's bad enough if it was children. But now we're actually dealing with other factors in society. So, um, you know, things are moving fast. So at this point, it's only um, when I made that video, I think it was 2018. It's only six years later. And uh, what I was saying then was new, and now I think it's widely accepted within five years. Everybody accepts that social media is harmful in some way. Whereas, you know, back then it was, people were like, what do you mean? How is it harmful? Um, so, and I think the digital depression has to do with the fact that, that when young people in particular, teenagers, preteens, and young adults, say age is 12 to 25, might be the highest risk period, when they get on these phones and they're interacting with each other about, where are you going? Where are we meeting? Who's at a party where? Why am I not invited? Or they put up Instagram pictures about how great their lives are and how, and then one feels bad about one's own. Or if you put up any post, you can expect all kinds of negative, maybe some negative reactions from people. Or even if you don't, you worry about getting the negative reactions. All that produces negative emotions. And uh, now this is well documented in uh, various psychological survey studies. There have been many different ones that have been done in the last 10 years. And these are the studies that show that negative psychiatric symptoms like depression, anxiety feelings, and suicidal thoughts have really gone up quite high uh, in, in, these, in, these, in these ages. Just to give you an idea, we always said that the depression rate in the general population was 10%. And the suicide rate is a fraction of 1%. And the suicidal thinking rate is less than 10%. It's probably 5% at most in the general population. But in teenagers, you're looking at about 10 to 20% suicidal thinking rates. And depression rates, feelings of depression that are bothersome to them, 
in the 20, 30 percent range. So a two to three fold increase in all of these symptoms. Um, and as I said in the video, there's no biological explanation for this. So sometimes people will say, well, you don't really know the social media is causing this. It could just be something else. But I just have no idea what else it could be as a doctor and a psychiatrist. The social media is clearly there and caught and makes sense that it's causal. And we have no other explanation. Professor, so tell us a little bit, how can you tell if someone's digitally depressed? You just spoke about teenagers and adolescents. Those are, are have always been, I imagine, uh, the uh, most difficult group to deal with. When we think about adolescents, we think about people constantly being depressed or over-emotional mm -hmm. or all that. Mm -hmm. um, tell us, how do you know um, if someone's depressed? And I mean, even today, uh, you know, as you said in the video, everyone's looking at their phone. I mean, even when I go to a bakery in the morning, I look at my phone so I don't have to look at other people because I know if I look at other people, they'll think I'm, you know, not minding You're my weird. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, so how do you know, you know, if someone's just depressed or someone like me is trying to be courteous? Exactly. It's difficult with adolescents in particular. Um, as you said, normal adolescence involves a lot of mood moodiness um, as people are dealing with becoming adults, young adults. Um, and it's also the, the age of onset for biological psychiatric depression. Uh, people who have manic depressive illness, bipolar illness, and recurrent depression, it typically starts around age 15 to 20. So it's very difficult to know, is it a real true onset biological psychiatric disease we're dealing with? Is it kind of a temporary phase of adolescent moodiness? Or is it depression from other causes of which the most important, in my view these days, is this uh, social media, smartphone, digital cause, which I'm calling digital depression. Um, and there's a couple ways to figure that out. The biological one with, is, one has a better sense of that if there's family history, like there's a genetics of mood illness in the family. So on the father's and mother's side, there will be multiple people, or at least some people that may have had manic depression, bipolar illness, or severe depression. If there's not that kind of genetics, then it's probably not a biological disease because those diseases are purely genetic. In terms of the adolescent moodiness, uh, it's hard to know when you're in the middle of it, but it does get better over time. So once you know 15, age 15, 16 might be horrendous, but by 17, 18, things are a little better. That's how you know it's that. So you don't know that until you kind of get through it. In terms of digital depression, I think one way of telling it is it partially you could correlate it with the amount of use. As we said, the use is very high to begin with. So your baseline is high. You know, kids are using these things four to eight hours a day easily. So, but if somebody's on it 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day, if the kids are sleeping with it, which they are anyway, but they're sleeping with it and it's they're up in the night texting people, it's excessive in that sense. Uh, then that's a, the Caesar signs that, that this might be causal. And the way you can know is you take the phone away. And so there's, you know, in, in, in general in science, the way you can tell if something causes something else is if A happens before B, and then you take away A and B goes away, that's probably the cause. That's the only way you can to, to it's on off, as they say, turn it on, turn it off. And so even as a test, and not to say, you know, I'm taking your phone away forever and there's a huge debate, but if you take it away for a few days or a week and things change, that's a sign that you might be dealing with digital depression. And uh, tell us a little bit about what, so, so, so social media abuse, what, what exactly does that mean? So you, you're saying, okay, they're using it 12 hours or whatever, but how, it, what does healthy social media practice look like? Uh, as we know, we can find, you know, now anything, we can learn anything from the internet, all the good information's out there. It's also all the bad information at the, some, at the same time. It's really, we right. decide what we want, the interactive uh, aspect, as you mentioned before. Right. At, what does healthy social media use look like? Well, um, I can just give you my opinion. There's no real proven standards on this. Um, but I think if you if you use the six to eight hour range as an average amount for teenagers and young adults for the use of social media, I think you could view that as a maximum. Um, and the healthy use would be that or less. You know, So like four hours a day actually would be quite good. It may, it may sound like a lot, but it's actually quite good 
Um, and certainly less than four hours a day would be a very healthy use of social media. Like if you're getting on to check, you know, you, all your social media accounts in an hour and you're off the rest of the day, that's very healthy use. Say you check your email. Think Just think about email, which is more of an adult thing. How many times a day do you check your email? Suppose you only check your email once in the morning for half an hour, and once at night for half an hour. Nobody does that, but ideally that would save you a lot of time. Uh, so, but even if you spent two hours on it, that would be good rather than four or five, six hours on email. Uh, video watching, YouTube is a big thing. A lot of young people use YouTube in place of watching television. So think about how people will easily spend four, six hours a day watching TV. Um, so maybe in some senses that's not extreme. But again, less than four hours would probably be meaningful. And also it's how you use it. You know, are you using it not in place of work? You know, it's downtime, it's relaxing time instead of keeping you from studying or working. Or are you doing it during the day as opposed to at night? It's not interfering with your sleep. That's a big problem. So the, the abuse is more excessive use, more than six and eight hours a day. And using it in ways that are non-functional, like interfering with your sleep middle of the night uh, or interfering with your work and study. That'd be my opinion about it. And before I bring in, I'm sure there are some questions the participants would like to ask or comments. But before I bring them in, uh, could you tell us any one or a, 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 an impressive story about someone whom you've treated, a good a success story about what that person came in looking like, the problem they had, and when uh, and if, how how it was successfully, uh, how it concluded happily. I'm I'm having to think because I can think of many um, failure stories, many and failure in the sense of I know many examples. I can give you stories of how people do poorly with this, um, but I, I I don't automatically have a story of us turning it around. Um, Partly because I wouldn't say that people come to me with depression, which is purely digital. You know, usually I, most of my patients that I see do have biological illness, but the digital use makes it worse. So it's more the scenario where we're treating them, say, with medications or whatever, but we're also trying to decrease their social media use to help us. Um, so I'm trying to think there's a college. I'll give you an example. I have a patient who's in college. He's 21 now and spends a lot of time on his phone. It's a source of conflict with his parents when he comes home after in between semesters. Um, and I've actually had to negotiate with both of them in the sense of getting the parents to let him have the phone some so that it, it, it isn't um, excessively causing more conflict between them, but also getting him to let them have the phone some so that he isn't actually over harming himself by overusing it. Uh, so it's become a compromise. and. And uh, there are times when they will have the phone for like an hour and then they'll give it back to him. And he's 21, so obviously technically an adult, but it's still relevant. And um, and I don't think it's made a major change in his depression, but I think it's more like it keeps it from being worse. I think the anxiety and the depression would be worse if he was just to have unlimited, unfettered uh, activity with his phone. That's the example that comes to mind. Professor, so in other words, this is something that's ongoing. This is a, a problem like alcohol, like any of those things. There is no real, um, how do I say, that we, we still don't know what the, you know, the benefits and the costs, they pretty much balance each other. There is no saying, oh, social media is definitely, it's a really a, a dual, a dual use, uh, a, a dual use tool that we can't say, you know, that's really good or that's really bad. We just have to make sure that we're in control of it. Is that it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we have to request that our, that our society, through its laws and its government, put some basic guardrails on this. And they've started to do that with some of these lawsuits that are happening now in the UK with suicide cases and so on. Um, there, there are some states that have restricted use of social media in below age, I think, 18 or 16. I think that's reasonable to at least have some basic guardrails like that. And then af after that, it it does involve a lot of within family discussion. So the best analogy is probably alcohol, but also technology, like maybe uh, prior technology, like driving cars, automobiles. Um, you can't just put a 14 or 15 year old behind a car. Even a 16 year old is risky. Uh, we all know that, the insurance companies know that. And there's a lot of you know guardrails that need to be put in there. And I think we have to think about smartphones and social media and the internet in general, like automobiles, it's it's 
something you have to learn how to manage so that you you can get some benefit from it, but avoid some of the harms. Wow. So that's striking information. As uh, as you said at the beginning, already in 2010, 2007, we all thought this is just, this is a virtue. This is something you can't possibly, <laughs> can't go wrong. And as you say now, well, actually, you know, it it's not intrinsically good or bad. It can go both ways. So you better be responsible with it. Right. right. Are, there, are there any questions? Are there, uh, would anyone like to uh, say something? Yeah, Dr. Davis would. Hi, Dr. Davis. Can you hear me now? I can. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, hi, and thank you very much. This is really an, an excellent presentation. I'm glad Sim got you to to participate. Um, I have to agree with you, uh, not just 100%, 101% from all the comments you made. But the big problem is, and, and you've alluded to it and you've dis uh, discussed it a little bit, is that you got to get... Uh, get the people away, the kids, the youngsters, the teenagers, and get them into doing something different other than sitting on their phone. I'm fortunate enough, I have about nine, if I kept uh, the, uh, the the count correct, grandchildren. And most of the, the parents there, um, they are really on top of this. And there's a limited amount of time. And I think that's very, very important. I think the other side to bring up here is the fact that I think I wish they would talk about this on television, in the newscast and things like that, which a lot of people watch television and uh, their kids are in the next room with their, uh, with their cell phones. Right. And uh, come on and see what's going on in the world that's going to affect you and, and the rest of you, your friends. Um, I'm not sure of the answer. Uh, I don't think I'm going to come up with a, a real solid answer. I uh, About almost three months ago now, I passed my 91st birthday. And so I guess one way to look at it from my point of view is what the hell? And excuse the French, but uh, <laughs> it's a, a, an adult participation here. <laughs> but thank you very much. And you're down in Dot, you. is that correct? I'm sorry. Are you down in, at Dartmouth University? No, I'm in. I'm at Tufts in, in Boston. Oh, you're in Tufts. Yeah, I had a, a cousin of mine who was an MD who graduated from Tufts, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I figure ninety-one backwards. <laughs> yeah, but I'll, I'll sell it, buddy. Thank okay. you. Thank well, you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Doctor. Well, Davis. thank you for for talking and. Uh, keep up the good work, and I hope uh, you're very successful. Well, thank you. Um, you know, this is uh, this has just been kind of a this has felt like a uh, a burden, honestly, to, to 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 get into this issue. It wasn't something I wanted to get into. Um, and my my kids are now in their early twenties, and so they were smack dab in their mid teens in the twenty teens when this all kind of blew up. So I. I got into it more from personal experience as a father and then from somewhat clinically it's more obvious now. Um, and um, I think it's, 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 it's great that the millennial generation that now is having children is much more aware of this. They've grown up with it themselves. Our generation didn't grow up with this at all. So we were totally blindsided. Uh, but I think the society is get, starting to get a handle. Maybe things will gradually get better. But it, it's really been a mess for the last decade for for these uh, teens. Victoria, I Fred, I hope that's very true. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Doctor Davis. Victoria, Fred, you had a question. Yeah. Well, no, just a thought. Of, I guess it's a question. I wonder if you know the book "Last Child in the Woods," and uh, which was authored by Richard Louv, and uh, he's describing what he calls nature deficit disorder and the benefit of just getting kids out in nature. And his point is, yeah. you, you don't have to go to the Grand Canyon, you just have to go to your backyard and right. get to know get to know it intimately. But um, right. I just, do you know that book? Do you know that work? No, I don't. Thank that? you for telling me about it. No, I don't. Yeah. That sounds very interesting. It's a really great book. Yeah, he, he, we heard him speak. He spoke at his school that our kids were at, Richard L-O-U-V, 
is his name. And uh, he just, and he did, he was a scientist. So he did some mm -hmm. analysis uh, that um, indicating, I mean, just the benefit of, of just spending some time in nature for you. Very, Absolutely. Anybody, young people there's, in particular. There's benefits uh, across the board. And I want to just mention, there's also benefit for your eyes. And we're talking about the mind right now, but there are different parts of our bodies that are being affected by this new digital culture. And one that's really harmed is the eyes because we're sitting here staring at screens. Uh, so for instance, dry eye syndrome has markedly increased in the general population. It can lead to blindness eventually. Um, and it, it's very severe and untreatable. Um, so, um, also myopia, just in general, the, the the need to wear glasses is increasing probably because of the near focus that's constant now. Um, I got glasses when I was a teen because I read books a lot. Um, now it's happening. No one's reading books anymore, but the phone is, is a big cause. And some um, optometrists say that the cure is, or the, the only way you can manage both these issues, dry eye and, and worsening myopia, is to look at far distances, which means you got to be outside. <laughs> You can't be inside and doing this. And that's another benefit of getting outside besides kind of the larger spiritual probable part. But there's actually another aspect to our biology that's important. So one thing I do these days is I live in Cambridge in a very urban environment. I go out on my front porch with my dog, with a usually with a beer or a cup of coffee, depending on the time of day. And then I sit on the front porch for about 15 to 30 minutes and just watch people go by. And I try to look out into the distance towards Harvard Square and the trees and the park as far away as I can see, partly from my eyes, but partly just like, so I can stop looking up close all the time. And uh, my son, who's 21, has gotten into the habit of coming out with me and doing the same thing. Um, so whether, you know, people say you should go out and jog and exercise or walk, and then that way you get your whole body, but at the very least getting your body outside, whether even if you're just sitting like a lazy person like me, is beneficial for the body and for the mind and for the eyes as well. That, that's a lot of what Richard Liu wrote about for, for young people. Yeah, I'll you know, take a look at that. The whole yeah. kindergarten movement that started in Germany was, was based on that. You know, they went to kindergarten oh, school. Yeah, I think in our generation, we, we could take that for granted because we grew up outside and we were playing outside and we walked wherever we want to. Now it has to be really an effort to, to let kids have that kind of life. Yeah. Well, the other thing he wrote about is you know, the people are scared that the kid is going to get kidnapped, but that never happens. You know, it just it's doesn't so happen. Rare. You can let your yeah, kid that, out. No, no one's going to kidnap. <laughs> no, the, the online harms, the kidnapping of the mind is, is much, much more yeah. common than any physical kidnapping that ever happened. Okay. Thank you so much, Victoria and Fred. So let's go on to the last part of the show, which is how do you um, how do you uh, solve these problems? Are there any easy steps that we can take, Professor? So I've got here three easy steps that you you um, write about. First is limit social media use to no more than two hours per day. Don't let teens sleep with their phones. Limit the social media platforms your teens use. Can you tell us about these uh, easy rules to follow? Yeah. Um they're not all that easy to do, but uh, this will be ideal. So the two hours a day is ideal. Now, this is based on a study uh, with Facebook where they randomized college students to being on their phones less than two hours a day or unlimited. And by being on less than two hours a day, they reduced their depression by almost, almost a half. Um, I think four hours is acceptable. But if you can get it to two hours a day or less, that that is probably the most healthy use of um, social media, of also any digital activity like watching YouTube, uh, but as adults even spending time on internet searching and emails. Getting the phone away from the teens at night is really, really important. If you live in a place where you have more than one floor, put the phones on a different floor than where the teen sleeps. Um, that's really ideal. Again, people have a hard time doing this. We did manage to do that in my family. Um, limit the social media platforms your teen uses. There are some that are more harmful than others. Um, the, the, there is some research that shows that the least harmful is probably YouTube, probably because that's more of a television-like passive experience. Uh, and then the most harmful ones are Snapchat 
probably Snapchat's the most harmful because it's basically texting immediately with someone else and you're constantly aware by GPS where people are. So that can involve the most direct, immediate cyberbullying or any other kind of immediate negative effect. Instagram is the next most harmful because it involves pictures and people generally making their lives seem better than they really are. That makes other people feel worse. You can also direct message people through Instagram. And so that can make it a little more like Snapchat. And then the next most harmful is probably uh, Facebook. Uh, and that's a little more adults, but middle-aged adults, but that that can, and young adults too. Um, and then uh, the, the least harmful, uh, like I said, is, is YouTube. And probably after that, LinkedIn, which tends to be more professional usage. Um, I should mention Twitter would be in the middle there. Twitter is probably around Facebook, like a little better than Instagram, but not as good as YouTube and LinkedIn. So if you can limit your social media platform use to the less harmful ones like YouTube, LinkedIn, and avoid the more harmful ones like Instagram, Snapchat, that probably would be better too. Okay. And now we have also here some activities that inversely affect depression. One, sports and exercise. Two, attending religious services. Three, reading books and or print media. Four, in-person social interactions. And five, doing homework. So, Professor, I asked you before if uh, I said that, you know, we all thought that social media was just a positive, a virtuous thing that you could do when it first came out. Now we realize, no, it's actually a powerful thing that could do. Yeah, it's a powerful tool that can be used for, for both good and bad. These uh, five activities, are they all just good or how do they fit in? Fit in. I think these this list probably comes from, there's some research that associates less depression uh, with people who exercise more, people who are more religious, et cetera, people with more social interactions. Uh, so there's, there is research that supports that. Um, I think in terms of maybe newer concepts, I'm going to just emphasize, we already talked about getting outside and being outside. So sports and exercise would relate to that. Um, I'll, just, I'll just walk through them. The religious activity, it's from a mental health perspective, that's good. I know in our culture, you know, we talk about separating religion and politics. And some people are very anti-religious and it's very secular culture. And that's all fine for anyone's personal belief systems. But uh, it it is, there's a direct correlation between people who are more active in whatever religious group they're active, and generally speaking, less anxiety and depression. So if you are in a, in a setting where religious activity is condoned or or viewed as a positive thing, um, or you are in a family that that supports that view, it's actually in problem from a psychiatric perspective, it's not harmful and probably helpful. Though, of course, if you're not in that kind of setting, it's not something you'd want to impose on anyone or that anyone needs to do. Um, Doing homework, I'll just jump to that. Obviously, it's beneficial. Um, but uh, I'm going to focus on reading books and the social interactions. Print media. Um, in our family, we've kept up uh, the daily Boston Globe print newspaper subscription. And um, it's gotten very expensive because so many people have stopped subscribing. It's a lot cheaper to do it digitally. Uh, but it does make a difference. And I always have the newspaper laying around. And, and my son, for instance, will look at the sports pages more and get interested in sometimes. Or if I find an article that's interesting, I point it out to him and say, hey, read this article. It's really interesting. Reading books is difficult at, at this age. I find that it's really less common that children, uh, young adults are reading books. And uh, whatever we can do, obviously, to physical books to support that is beneficial because it takes you away from the digital habit. Still not great for your eyes, but at least it takes you away from the digital habit. In-person social interactions, very, very important. And um, that's a big, we haven't talked about that much. That's another negative and not so much personal depression, but that young people are having difficulty even talking on the phone with each other, much less in person, engaging. And everyone talks about being a little autistic these days. Autism is a biological disease that's purely genetic. That also did not suddenly increase in the last decade. And my hunch is that the sense that people are a little autistic is probably also worsened by the increased reliance on digital interaction. So if we can get people to text less and email less and get on the phone at least and talk verbally or even voice message, you can voice message on these texts. That's what I've been doing more. Uh, so people hear your voice and of course, get together in person. The more you can do that, the, the, the more beneficial it is for your, your psychological health. 
Okay, final thought. Professor, what do you wish all of us, uh, those here, those those listening, all of us everywhere, the next time we are staring into our smartphone? What do I wish you the next time you're staring into your smartphone? Uh, I guess I wish you would uh, put it away and stare out far into the distance, as far as you can see, at the treetops and the tops of the buildings. Okay. Let's see how we can stay in touch with uh, Professor uh, Gami. So his uh, website is psychiatryletter.com. And this also has some uh, resources for, for, for people looking into digital repression. Is that right, Professor? Yeah, we have articles that I've written that there are blog posts. Uh, and um, the, the webinars are a little more clinical, but there's a lot of articles and blog posts on there. Um, I also have a sub stack where a lot of the same articles are on and I have things on a regular basis. So if you just Google my name and sub stack, that'll pop up as well. Okay, excellent. And uh, people can reach out to you here if they have any questions. Is that right? They can. And I'm also very reachable on Twitter. Um, so use, useful social media. So people can, can send a message to me there. Um, and, and there are various ways, but uh, definitely psychiatryletter.com. If you send an email where it says contact us, it'll get to me. Excellent. So feel free to reach out to Professor Ga Gaimi, and uh, he'll he'll be glad to talk to you to answer your questions, uh, hear your comments. Thank you so very much uh, to Professor Nasir Gaimi. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So let's see what's coming up next week on Vienna Live. We have here Oded Tsur, My Prophet. Saxophonist Oded Tsur's meditative new ECM album, My Prophet, anoints music as the epicenter of a spiritual discipline, a prophet that tells us not about the future, but about who we really are. Through a myth-like suite of five movements, the band leader tells the story of an all-powerful deity experiencing everything from sobering murmurs to cathartic, unabashed ecstasy. Recorded right at the beginning of the Israel-Hamas war, the events of October 2023 put the project on the verge of cancellation multiple times. With its eventual green light, the studio session took on the shape of a meditation on its original theme, the an unequivocal offering, unequivocal offering of faith in one single person as an attempt to regain our collective faith in who we are. Come welcome Oded to our show, and he will show us how music can be a spiritual practice. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmore.com. That's next Wednesday again, Oded Sur, my prophet. And at the same time, you can sign up for the Friday newsletter. Love to include you in that. Again, thank you so very much to Professor Nasir Gaimi. Thank you to Victoria and Frederick Mulligan, as well as Agnieszka and Benoit Rivole for their support of this show. Thanks to my cousin, Mike, a marketer from Layer App. If you're an engineer or an architect, they have a really cool tool you should check out. Thank you also to Mary Schlesinger for the lovely Viennese library you can see behind me. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile from Boston, Massachusetts, and New London, New Hampshire. Goodbye, and see you next Wednesday. <laughs>